welcome to Gold Creek. We are so glad you're here. If it's your first time here, we want you to know that Gold Creek is a church where it doesn't matter what your background is, what you've struggled with in the past, or what you're currently struggling with, you are welcome here. Gold Creek isn't a church for people who have it all together. It's a community of people who believe we can find hope and purpose in Jesus Christ. We believe that God gives us hope and grace through His Son, Jesus. We believe in community and connection. When you're ready, we encourage you to check out our Connect groups. It's the best place to find your people here at Gold Creek. For our online family, we have chat hosts who would love to meet you and answer any questions you may have. Jump into the chat and introduce yourself. It's a great way to meet people and get connected. We have a kid's experience for birth through eighth grade on site on Sunday mornings. It will be the best hour of their week. And most importantly, kids will hear an age appropriate biblical message that they how to get your kids checked in. Grab a cup of coffee on your way back into the worship center. Yes, you can bring it into service. We know that trying out a church for the first time can bring up a lot of questions, so here's what to expect in the next hour. We will sing a few songs. We love to worship, and sometimes it gets a little loud. Join in however you are comfortable. Sing loud, raise your hands, clap if you want to. Then one of our pastors will share a relevant biblical message that you can apply to your life. Then we'll pray and head into our week. We hope you will stick around and meet a few people in the lobby after service. Again, we're so glad you're here. Let's get ready for worship. Good morning, Gold Creek. Let me stand to our feet. Let's sing this out together. Wandering into the night. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. Try to thumb my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me. choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friend burning and bitterness you can't just keep it moving now you're welcome here but now till I walk the streets of gold So Another one, I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hell, that's another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell, that's another one. I am free. Who oh, I am free. I am free. Hell, that's another one. I am free. I am free. I am free.
out one more time. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name, forever free, I'm not the same. I think the master, I think the savior, who oh, I think God.
to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief a man of sorrow son of suffering oh blood and tears how can there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering, all sing this out together. Distant and removed, but you chase us down in merciful pursuit. To the sin you will grace, and the broken you will grace. And in the end, the proof is in your mouth. And in the end, the proof is in
How can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, and hallelujah to the son of suffering, and hallelujah to the son of suffering. suffering yes God we give you thanks we give you thanks Lord for what you did on that cross for us over 2,000 years ago you called us out of darkness into your precious light you called us from death to life from mourning to dancing Lord Jesus we thank you for your sacrifice it's because of it that this morning we can come together to lift up your holy name, to worship you. We thank you. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning and thank you. Amen. Hey, it's so great to worship you with you this morning, Gold Creek. Uh, before you have a seat, turn a couple neighbors around you. Tell them good morning. It's great to see you. Good morning, Gold Creek. How are you this morning? Good, man. Hey, if we don't know each other, my name's Nick. I'm the lead pastor here. So glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we are excited as a church. Our team's been getting excited for Easter weekend here at Gold Creek. And I want to let you know two things coming up for Easter. The first one is this, is I am so excited to celebrate baptism as a church. We have a bunch of people taking a next right step, going public in their faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm excited to celebrate that all weekend. If, you're, if you are ready to get baptized, or maybe you'd say, hey, I'm not sure if I'm ready, but I might be ready. I've made a decision to be a Jesus person. After our weekend services in this room right over here, we have about a 10-minute class information session on baptism. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. If you might be ready, but you're not sure if you're ready, man, come hang out for 10 minutes. We'll keep your kids for you. Uh, and, and just explore it, what that means for you if that's the next right step in your faith. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. You'll, you'll hear us talk about this for the next few weeks. This is how we're preparing as a church, and especially if Gold Creek is your home church. Here's what I'm asking you to do is attend one service, so come to church with us on Easter, serve one. We have all kinds of places you can serve on Easter. Uh, maybe you don't normally serve. Maybe you'd say, hey, we want to serve as a family. Maybe you're looking to get away from your family. Both work. You can serve with us on Easter weekend here. So attend one, serve one, and then bring one. Man, I'm asking the question of my life right now, who's close to me but far from God? Who could use the invitation to come hear the good news about Jesus Christ on Easter weekend? And especially around a weekend like this, man, I'm always amazed at how receptive people are, maybe that who normally wouldn't be around Easter. So you'll hear us talk about that as we come into the Easter season. So excited for what God's going to do in and through uh, our lives in that way. Hey, in just a second, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. If you've come prepared to participate with us in that way, so many of you uh, extend generosity, not to Gold Creek, but really you're faithful to the Lord in this way. And here's what it means for us as a church. I got an email this week. I didn't really see it in the national news cycle, but I got an email from one of our disaster relief partners, Convoy of Hope. You've heard us talk about Convoy of Hope before. And there were some tornadoes throughout the Southeast, and they said, hey, we just want you to know that we've already 
responded. We have boots on the ground there. And, and here, I had a moment as I was reading that email where I was so proud of our church. Man, because of your generosity, your faithfulness to the Lord, we've already been able to respond to people in the middle of, devastate, of a devastating crisis. People wondering, hey, how am I gonna get power back on? What's gonna be next for me? And, and our partner, Convoy of Hope, has met practical needs in the middle of that moment. So I wanna say thank you. Wanna say way to go to you uh, in that way. You got a few different ways you can give here at Gold Creek. You can give online. Uh, you give here in the service. You can utilize our safe and secure text to give option uh, as well. Hey, in the middle, um, there's some buckets there. If you're sitting in the middle, would you go ahead and pass that down now? And today I'm really excited. We have uh, Gold Creek's founding pastor with us, Pastor Dan Kellogg. Uh, if you know Pastor Dan, uh, you're excited. If you don't know Pastor Dan, yeah, we clap for that. If you don't know... Um, Pastor Dan, I know a lot of us are new at Gold Creek, and Pastor Dan is our founding pastor. His church wouldn't be here without him, his family, their faithfulness and leadership. So excited for that today. I also want to show you this right before Pastor Dan comes up. Uh, you heard us talk about it. You've heard us talk about it as a church. Uh, we've uh, In October, we did an initiative called Forge the Future. And so just look for updates about Forge the Future uh, throughout the year, what really your generosity is doing. And so before Pastor Dan comes up, take a look at this. Gold Creek. My name is Blake and we are currently in our canceled sermon series and we want to know what you have been canceled for. We're going to ask some of you guys here this morning and let's find out. I was out comedy show. I was in the middle of my friends and everyone had like drinks and stuff like that. Anyways, they got me on tape and the video blew up. Started looking at like, oh, there's a pastor with drinks and everything around him. It went viral and people were like, this is not a pastor. This oh, no. Not a man of God. Yeah. Canceled. 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 A time you have been canceled in your life. Sure. At work for being a Christian. Just got to just gotta make it known and uh, yeah. fight, for, uh, fight for the truth, right? Have I been canceled? I don't know. Have you been canceled? Uh, perhaps so. <laughs> care, care to share? Uh, no. Okay, there you go. How have you been canceled in your life? Well, let's see. Probably I got canceled. It was only a short, short tenure, but I was canceled when I became a Coug and my whole entire family are Huskies. Oh, go Cougs. I have been canceled for not loving Disney movies. I'm not a big Disney movie fan. Like I've seen them, but like I'm not as into them. What is a way in your life you have been canceled? I have definitely been kicked out of a church because I walked in with flip-flops and told me to like go back with shoes and a couple restaurants. Have there been any times in your life you have been canceled? Ooh. Well, I mean, I was a band geek, so I feel like yes, just that, yeah, off of premise. Yeah. That's gotta, I mean, and you're owning it to this oh, day. yeah. That was a great time. Yeah. It's a niche thing, but you know, like, good friends. Yeah. Thank you, Shauna. Yeah. Band geek, owning it. Here I am. Take care. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Bye. All right, when's the last time you were canceled? I'm just curious. I, I want you to, honest of you, it was on the way to church today. Right? Your teenagers said, ah, oh, dad. Ah, oh, mom. When was the last time? Turn to your neighbor. Well, when was the last time you were canceled? Just kind of just get, share with your neighbor for a minute. This is just us. When's the last time you were canceled? Come on, let's be, I mean, there's a lot of reasons you get canceled, right? I remember um, one time I was a pastor of a church, like around here somewhere. <laughs> 
And I remember it was so funny. I, at the door, I would greet people. And we had so many. We had such a great time. And thank you. I, you know what I love is I look around here and I don't know most of you. Awesome. Congratulations. You don't know the old guy that showed up today to talk, but here I am, and I get to share with you. But some of you are old timers. You know who I am, and you know what it's like to be around here. It's awesome. Uh, but the most often time that I got canceled, this is the most common cancellation that ever happened to me, is someone would meet me at the door and say, Pastor, we're going to be going to a different church. And I said, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. And, you know, I I would wait to hear. And they would look me in the eye and they would say, you're just not very deep. (laughs) And I I would just say to them, you can go any direction and go find a pastor that's deeper than me, smarter than me, all that. Great. Just go to a church somewhere. It's true. I may not be the deepest person in the world, but I'm just trying to follow Jesus. Congratulations. Be on your way. <laughs> I got canceled often. The thing that hurt me the worst, though, was I, never, I got canceled when no one would ever talk to me. Like, they would avoid me. They'd leave the church, and then I'd see them in the store, and they would, like, turn their heads. <laughs> it's like, come on. We're all adults here. Come on. I got canceled. It's okay. It's okay to get canceled. So I want to talk to you today about the kind of things that canceled Jesus. And, and Pastor Nick's been talking about it. We've been doing this on a regular basis. I actually watched Pastor Nick two weeks ago plead with you not to cancel him because of the way he spelled cancel. I thought that was hilarious. I, I look at it, I go, cancel with an L or two Ls? Man, I would have been canceled a long time ago if spelling was the big deal, I'm telling you. Just cancel me completely. But I, you know, I looked at that. I was watching the services, and I, I got to say this to you. I'm so honored that Pastor Nick has chosen to lead this congregation, and he's doing an amazing job. I, I really mean that. And I'm honored. He, he says, hey, come, come talk. Every once in a while, he lets me come back and share. And I'm I just feel honored because I love what God's doing here. I love what's next for you. I love the things that God has in mind for you. And I get to be a part of it. Just a small part of it. Thank you. And thank you, Pastor Nick. You're amazing. We love you. We love what God's doing with you. I shared with you a, a verse this morning that I got in my devotions. That was such a cool moment for me just to be reminded of my prayer for this church and, and how God's answered that prayer for this church. And I'll let him share with you sometime. But that's not what we're talking about today. I want to talk to you about being canceled. And I thought it would be the perfect day to talk about being canceled because it's the 17th of March, which is, anybody know? You know what the 17th of March is. <laughs> what is it? St. Patrick's Day. Okay, so if you're going to get canceled, you're going to get canceled for not wearing green. So just for a minute, look around, and this is the perfect example of being canceled. Just, just poke somebody. Give them a hard time. If there's no green on the person next to you, just poke somebody. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've got green on me, just to let you know. <laughs> I have some green on me because I'm not wearing green on this day. And what's funny to me, and I want to talk to you about St. Patrick's because I actually did a little research about St. Patrick's because a lot of people don't know the story of St. Patrick, the real story. And the story of St. Patrick actually kind of connects to what I want to talk about today. St. Patrick's Day, by the way, March 17th is the day he died. You're celebrating St. Patrick's Day on the day he died. And what's crazy is this crazy guy who's a British guy, not an Irish guy. He's a British guy who became a missionary to Ireland. And on the day he died, we all wear green. He never wore green. That's what I found out. (laughs) He used a, a, a green clover to explain the three leaves. And he used it to explain the Trinity to the people that he was trying to reach. He would talk about one plant and three divisions and and talk about the power of God and this Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He had all these cool things. But 
the other thing is that he's called St. Patrick's Day and he considered himself not a saint and he was never made a saint by the Catholic Church. He's not a saint. In fact, one of the things you'd find out about him is that he would say, I'm not very good. I'm not perfect. I haven't got it all together. I'm doing my best. I, he really clearly was not a saint, but we call it St. Patrick's Day. So here's his story. Born in, 18, or born in 484. 484 years after the death of Christ, he was born to a British upper-class family. At age 16, he was kidnapped by some Irish pirates who took them back to the Irish island and enslaved him for six years. He worked for an Irish king in a, in a horrible situation where he was desperate in the darkest time of his life, he became closer to God than he'd ever been. In fact, it, it, his story is that's when he really found God. That's when he really met God. And in a dream, God convinced him that there would be a boat waiting for him if he could make him way, his way to the coastline. So he escaped his slavery hiked 200 miles back to the coast where there was a boat that he, he got on, went back to his family, and as he got back to his family, he was so converted, so changed in his life that he decided to become a pastor, and it took 15 years of schooling. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have made 15 years of schooling for pastor. I didn't do that. I am shallow, you know. Uh, so... 15 years to be a, a priest missionary. And God gave him this dream. Here's this crazy dream. To go back to the place that enslaved him. Isn't that crazy? And it, it, it kind of makes sense. Because he saw the problems of the Irish people, which were completely influenced by this druid priesthood. Now, let me tell you about the Irish Druids. I know you're going to say, what in the world, where are you going with this? But let me explain this to you. The Irish Druids were these priests or prophets who had huge influence over society. And they would bring animal sacrifices in, birds and, and different animals. They were considered holy animals. And they would kill them. They would drip the blood through these two spoons. And the way that they spattered on the ground told the future. And the priest would tell the future. They were prophets of the kind. And ultimately, the, the, the huge problem that the Druids provided is that in order for the big decisions to be made, there always had to be human sacrifices. So they would plunge a knife into a live sacrifice, watch how the blood splattered on the ground and tell the future. And here's this guy, Patrick, who is seeing all this and seeing the devastation that this religion is bringing to this island. And he has this dream to help the people have hope. A different kind of, of hope. He understood the culture. And so he came back to share the faith. So, interesting thing. You can go to the next slide if you would. Um, he was put in prison when they were sent back there. The first attempt, to actually, to send missionaries to Ireland, um, they were unsuccessful. But Patrick was sent back by the church. He was put in prison. He was persecuted. He was every attempt to cancel him, but they couldn't cancel him. His boldness in sharing the faith of Jesus Christ in their language, understanding their culture, he brought Jesus to Ireland. Now, I, I want to share that with you because I kind of think that's what this story is about today. See, Jesus was, they did everything they could to cancel Jesus. They tried to cancel him in every way, but they can't cancel him. They could not cancel him. In fact, 484 years after Jesus was ultimately canceled on the cross, he's still alive. He's alive in Ireland through a guy named St. Patrick that couldn't be canceled because the power of Jesus Christ resides in all of us that really genuinely follow him. So let's dig in. What was it about Jesus? How did he handle it when he was canceled? Let's look at the ways he was canceled. And you can find this in Mark chapter 2, verse 13. 
Jesus went out to the lake shore again. He taught the crowds that were coming to him. So just look at that verse again. He went out to the lake shore again. What does that mean? This is his method. You know, Jesus didn't hang out at the synagogue. He didn't have people come in and talk to him. He was always going out, walking, meeting people. He, his method was to go out where the people were. And when he went out, the crowds came. So the very first thing, I want you to understand the first thing that really canceled Jesus, and that was his popularity. And I think this is kind of cool because I think, I think Jesus' popularity, still, he, he's still attracting crowds because our world, even though they don't know they need it sometimes, needs desperately what he has. And maybe you're here today and you, don't, you stumbled in here and some old guy's up there talking and God's Holy Spirit is working in your soul and he's, he has what you need today. He has this, this thing that, that you don't understand completely, and there's something stirring your soul. That's, that's what has attracted you here today to the message of Jesus Christ, that is soul-changing, powerful message. And the crazy thing about St. Patrick is he planted 300 churches in Ireland. You know why we celebrate him today? Because he planted 300 churches. He baptized 10,000 people. That's unbelievable. In our world, let's have, let me talk to you about the popularity of Jesus Christ. You know they tried to cancel him, but the crowds still come to him. Because in our world today, 3.5 billion people say they're Christians in our world today. There's no other religion that's, uh, the, the next closest religion is 1 billion people away. And that's the Muslim religion. Our world went from having Nobody followed Jesus Christ to 3.5 billion. Now, I know in the state of Washington, the message hasn't got out. Apparently, <laughs> they don't know they need Jesus. We're, uh, we're considered the, mo the least, I guess, the least uh, followers of any God. They're, they're like, no, I don't need nothing. I just want nothing. We're like Ireland. And, and Seattle is a little like the, the, the same kind of place. And, and I think about it, but you know what I know? If they just knew who God was, if they just knew who, what he would do for them, man, they'd be right there following him. Following him. You know what I, I say? In your life, you know what Jesus did? Jesus didn't worry about the people who were trying to cancel him. What he did is he worked with the crowds that were with him. There's a, a good friend of mine that, that gave me some good advice early on in my pastor's uh, world. And he says, you, it's like kindergarten. You have this sandbox and you're playing in your sandbox. And there's people that will get in your sandbox and play in your sandbox. And there's some that won't. Just play with the ones that are in your sandbox. And, and I just think of you in your life. It doesn't matter who cancels you. What matters is who's with you, who's in your sandbox. God's put him there for you to influence. Use these moments in your time to influence him. Well, the, the story goes on. There's some other things that cancel Jesus. As he walked along, so remember Jesus come along the shore, the crowds are coming. As he walks along, he sees Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, if you know the story, he's already called four fishermen, James and John, Peter and Andrew. And they're coming through, and these guys would have met Matthew a lot. Levi is his name. Levi, son of Alphaeus, collecting taxes. Now, I want you to understand something. Levi was a Jewish person whose Mom and dad named him Levi. And you know why they named him Levi? Because in their minds, the Levites, the Levites always had this job. And their job was to take care of the holy things in the temple. They were, they were like temple servants. They would be like the staff on your church today. They always had this dream that their son would be a 
staff person in the local temple, that this, this son would serve for holy things. And instead, where does Jesus find this guy? He's sitting at a tax collector's booth. And what he has done is he's traded the sacred for the unholy. Because in those days, the belief in the system was that if you were a tax collector, you didn't get to go to the temple. You didn't get to worship God. You didn't get to do any of those things. And so Levi had made a decision. I'm not going to serve at the temple, but I'm going to make a deal with the Roman government, and I'm going to collect taxes from these people. And the, the other thing that happened for him is that he traded his mission, the thing that his parents wanted him for, for money. For money. And here's Jesus looking at a guy who's totally disappointed his parents. Now, just stop here for a minute. Is anyone here a disappointment to your parents? I, I mean, just deep in your soul, you know, you're the, you're the person that your parents said, wow, they could have done better. I wish they'd have done this with their life. That's Levi. And what does Jesus come along to this disappointment to parents? He comes along and he says, follow me and be my disciple. So Levi got up and followed him. The second thing that canceled Jesus, let me, let me help you understand this. The second thing that canceled Jesus is his choice of disciples. When, they, when Jesus chose Levi, everyone in town was upset because the tax collectors were like the spiritual lepers of the day. You did not spend time with the tax collector. You hated the tax collectors because they were dishonest. They weren't allowed to, to um, they weren't allowed to go and be a witness in a trial because they were considered a known liar. They were not allowed in the temple to worship or the synagogue. So when the temple doors were open, they would be stopped at the door and said, you're not allowed in here. You cannot worship God. They were isolated and lonely, and they were considered the worst of the worst. And Jesus walks along and says, hey, why don't you follow me? You can become one of the leaders of the Christian church. And I don't know what his mom and dad felt at that moment, but I just got a sense that somewhere they, they were praying all along, God, would you do something to change my son's situation? And Jesus comes along and changes everything. He gives him a chance to completely start over. Isn't that great? You know, the, that, that's the story of Jesus in all of our lives, if we really are honest. We take our lives and we live our lives the way we want to live our life. And then there's a moment where we finally give him all of our life and he gives us a chance to do it again. Now, the story goes on. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to go home uh, to his home as dinner guests. So in other words, they're going to invite him all over for dinner along with many tax collectors. So now he's bringing his buddies along. Now, they haven't decided to follow Jesus. They're just his buddies. It says, many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. And this little quotation here, I love this quotation. There were many people of this kind. And I don't think that was flattery. I don't think that was a good thing. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. What about you? I think about what canceled Jesus. Think about what canceled Jesus. It's the kind of people, these kind of people. So I'm just curious. We're here in church today. I don't know if some of you, um, I know some of you, but I'm going to do something crazy. I want you to turn the lights on in the auditorium in a minute. I'm going to do something bold here. Get nervous. <laughs> how many of you, now don't do anything yet. How many of you are those kind of people? Don't, don't raise your hand yet. Come on. <laughs> You're way too eager. 
way too eager. But here's, here's what I mean by that. Think about this. Tax collectors were the spiritual lepers of the day, notorious sinners, people that had, they had made a wreck of their life. I, I, I want you to really think about this. I realize this is not everybody in this room, and it's okay. You, it's not a, a badge to be one of those kind of people. But what I do want to think about today is the thought that Jesus called those kind of people. And I want you to look around the room, and we're going to keep the lights up here. Now, I want you to just, if you really are going to be bold enough to say this, I want you to raise your hand and say, you know what? I'm that kind of person that Jesus called. Man, that's me. I want you to do that. Go ahead and raise Raise your hand. There you go. I know. Okay, look around. Okay, now, you just admitted you're dirty, rotten sinners. Come on, you guys. This is kind of crazy. You just admitted you're one of those kind of people. Now, what I think is interesting, in a large church, sometimes we hide and we think, if they only knew what we were like, if they only knew what I've done, where I've been, what I've said, who I've hurt, what kind of a mess I've made of my life. You're Levi sitting at a table and Jesus is walking by and saying, hey, you want to do something different with your life? Do you want to have a change? Come follow me. What a simple message. Well, the story goes on. When the, religious, when the teachers of religious law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the tax collectors and the other sinners, they asked Jesus, or they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Which, if you raise your hand, you just got called scum. You just got canceled. I mean, think about that. If the religious leaders were here today and they looked at you and you raised your hand and you said, this is me, I'm that guy, I'm son. you just got called scum. But the question is such a great question. And it really makes this point to me. I think Jesus got canceled because of his why. Because of his mission. Now, I ask questions a lot of times about I, I ask the why. When you see things, you go, why? Why that? Why this? You always ask the question, why? I ask the question, why, a lot. Like, here's some examples of some things I've asked questions, why, about. Have you seen this thing? This is called the uh, wife-carrying competition. It's an actual competition in Britain where you, you carry your wife and you go through this obstacle course and they have this whole thing. It's a wife-carrying competition. Now, what I think the church should do, I don't know whether you've seen this. I've seen Pastor Pablo and Pastor Nick, and I've seen their wives. I'd love to see a competition with the two of them carrying their wives around. I think you should have an annual competition that you do that every year, but you ask the question, why? Who came up with this idea? Why is this wife-carrying thing? And boy, and some of you are going, wow, that wouldn't work for me, but maybe she could carry you. I don't know. Here we go. So then I, I asked this question. I, I looked at this. Why camel jumping? If you go to the Middle East, there's camel jumping. Or I, I thought of this one. Uh, this is the one that really got me, which is uh, the toe wrestling. Have you ever seen toe wrestling? Uh, they actually have this competition. It makes me ask, why? Why the toe wrestling? Or the, the, this is my favorite. This is the one I really would like to be a part of, which is the underwater hockey. Uh, it's an actual thing where they have the underwater hockey game. I think I could excel in that really well. But you ask why. Why did that happen? They asked Jesus this question. Why are you hanging out with these notorious sinners? Now, what I love about Jesus is he actually answers this question. He says, I want you to know why. He's talking to the religious people now. He's not talking to the notorious sinners. He said, I want you to understand why I do this. He heard this in verse 17. And he told them, and here's the answer. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. 
Now, when you look at his answer, he starts with the I have not come for. Who's he not come for? Take, take a look at his first thing. I have not come for the I'm good crowd. To me, the hardest person to bring to faith is a person who says, I'm good. I'm good. I, I got it. I don't need God. It's kind of like the people that say, oh, I, I don't believe in nothing. I, I just, you know, we don't, you don't need God. I'm good. You know, essentially what they're saying is, I'm good enough to make my own morals. I'm good enough to be my own judge. I'm good enough to be God. Because I get to make the rules. And you don't get to make my rules. I'm good. These religious people were kind of setting themselves up to be the judge, which means they're the God. They're the ones that get to make the rules. Now, the problem with religious people, the problem with people that are I'm good kind of people is they have some blind spots. Now, I notice this a lot. Uh, people have blind spots, and, and I do a lot of speaking coaching now. I've been coaching a lot of pastors lately, and I was in a class just the other day where I had 10 wannabe pastors who were doing five-minute messages, and I was critiquing them. And this one guy got up, and in five minutes, he used the same word 30 times. And when I got up to do his critique, I said, hey, tell me what your filler word is. Tell me what your tick word is. And he says, I don't have one. I said, dude, you just use and um 30 times in five minutes. You have a tick word. You need to go listen to yourself and figure that out. And the truth is that all of us have these blind spots. And what I found in coaching speaking is that a lot of people don't understand that they're blind spots. And I know I have blind spots. My wife will tell me the things that I say, and I, I develop different problems in my speaking. And, and, and in my coaching, I'm always looking for how do I coach the blind spots, the truth is these Pharisees had some blind spots, and so do we. If you, you know, it's interesting. I, I've shared my faith with a lot, a lot of people. And when I come to this moment where I talk to them, hey, what do you believe about God? And a lot of times it's sitting in a hot tub or sitting somewhere, you know, where we're in public scenario. And I say, what do you believe about God? And They'll say, oh, I, my God is this and that. And they tell me all the things they believe about God. And, and I said, do you realize you just created your own God? Instead of seeking a God and trying to figure out how to please him, you've decided to make your God into your image so that you are pleasing to him. Your God. When you say, I'm good, you're just saying, I'm God. And there's this blind spot. But even for those that are religious people, like these religious people, they, we have our blind spot. For example, money. I, I just think about this, the blind spot. Sometimes religious people say, I'm good. I, I, I don't have any problems. I, I, I'm religious. I believe in God and all this. And, and then we find out they're very wealthy people. They can't sleep at night because they're worrying about the things that, the, that money has brought into their life. They have more temptation than they've ever had in their life. And they didn't mean to, but they've learned to trust their money to save them. And if something happens, and it might, and all of their money goes away, they're going to be devastated. And their blind spot is that they've learned to trust their money. Or I see the other blind spot I've seen is people with relationships. And I, I've had my own blind spots. I remember the first time I went to a marriage counselor and, and we were talking. My wife and I are trying to make our marriage better. And he's, he said, okay, Dan, on a one to ten scale, how's, how's your marriage doing? I said, eight. You know, Audrey's got a little improvement. She could do some better things here. So eight. And then, you know, the, he, says, uh, he says to my wife, what do you think? She goes, five. 
I was totally oblivious to what a jerk I was. How I wasn't prioritizing my relationships. And if I wasn't careful, my relationship was going to become broken because of my selfishness. And some of us are in this room here today. We have this blind spot. Our relationships, we say, I'm good, but we're not good. We're broken. And we need to work on it. And some of you, work becomes your blind spot where you give your life to a career and your identity is in your work and you sacrifice everything for your career. And you say, I'm good. I'm just giving my life away to this thing. Some of you, it's anger is your blind spot. You try and work yourself out of, you don't sleep enough, and you don't do this enough, and you, you are on the edge of being angry all the time. And you say, I'm good. But everybody around you is being burned by your anger that spills over on them. And what about God? Are you really good? You know what Jesus said? I didn't come for somebody that said, I'm good. I got it all together. He came for the broken people. In fact, the very next thing that he says, what does he say? I've come for those who know they're sinners. They know I'm bad. Now think about the people that are at this table. The first people at his table are the tax collectors. They've, tra they've traded their integrity for their money, for money. They've traded the temple for taxes. And then there's the prostitutes. It says that there, were, that there were tax collectors and prostitutes at the table. These were friends of the tax collectors because that's, that's who hung out. They couldn't hang out with anyone else. They were doing the wrong thing to survive. Now you say, ah, oh, I'm not a prostitute. But I have a question for you. I play this game all the time with teenagers. It's called, what will you do for 100 bucks? I love this game. I start out and I say, hey, will you let me break your little finger for a hundred bucks? Oh, it's really fun, you know. It's like, well, you know, what will you do for a hundred bucks? Will you run around the block for, in your underwear for a hundred bucks, you know? And they go on and, and then I finally get to the real questions. Will you lie to your parents for a hundred bucks? Absolutely, I'll do it for free. <laughs> Then I, you know, I say, what will you do for a hundred bucks? Well, will you cheat on a test for a hundred bucks? Oh yeah, I cheat. I do it. I did it last week. I don't, you don't have to pay me a hundred bucks. I cheat. You know what I'm doing? I'm just trying to figure out what kind of prostitute they are. What kind of prostitute are you? What will you do for a hundred bucks? And then there's our sinners. I, I mean, just think about it. It says other sinners. Those are the people that know they should do something different, and instead they're doing the wrong thing. And they're just admitting that they're bad. So Jesus said, I came for those that are bad. So I want to read this story to you. Because I think it's a story of who Jesus came for, for all of us. This is a story of Caleb. It's written by Pastor Steve. He's our pastor that ministers to people in jail. If you don't know that, Steve Strickler, Pastor Steve Strickler. Caleb is a formidable force, almost six foot tall, tattoos on every inch of his body. A top gang leader, Caleb's been in prison most of his adult life. He's a murderer. For the first 20 years of his incarceration, he was seen as one of the most violent prison, men in prison in the state of Washington. He spent over 10 years of his life in solitary confinement. It's called the hole, 23 hours a day in a six by eight room with nothing but a toilet and a stainless steel sink. One hour a day, he's led out to exercise. He was fed every day through a slot in his cell. Caleb was immersed in the gang life. As a gang leader, he determined who would get beat down and who would be protected. He was angry and bitter and the product of his environment. Then about 10 years ago, he woke up in the hole 
and he dreamed about trying to live a different life. He had no idea what that would look like, but he knew living the way he was was leading nowhere. He was transferred to Monroe, the correctional facility. He tried hard not to get involved with the gangs, but his reputation preceded him. Sticking to his plan, he began looking for ways to improve. He had a loathing for anything religious because he saw it was used as a way to manipulate uh, for prisoners to get what they wanted. He wasn't, wanted nothing to do with Christians or what they believed. But little by little, he found that the message of Christ was a little different than he'd heard about or seen in the gangs. Two years ago, he signed up for a class that taught about faith in a very different way. He learned about faith. He learned about peace, a life of peace. He learned that he could find some level of happiness by dealing with his anger, and he learned to take responsibility for his behavior, stop making excuses and justifying his bad choices. He found out what it meant to be accountable. He finally came to the place of confession, not confession for his sins, but for the damage he'd caused his own family and the victim's families that he'd harmed. Finally, telling a story to other inmates, he came to understand forgiveness for the very first time. He was ready for reconciliation to himself and finally to God. Caleb invited Christ into his heart for the very first time and understood God's unconditional love. The process was long, but last Sunday, Caleb was baptized in the chapel at the Moreau Congressional Facility by Pastor Steve. That's pretty cool. His language is still really colorful. Probably for some, the language you think would be wrong, but it's the least of the things the convicts are concerned about in prison. He says, I talked to Caleb last Tuesday night. He's a brand new Christian in Jesus Christ. Praise God. Those kind of people are the kind of people that Jesus walks up to and says, come follow me. Who are you in this story? Maybe you're the curious crowd and you simply need to go to one of our alpha classes and say, I want to figure out what Jesus is all about. I didn't think I needed him. I thought I was good, but I'm not. I need to learn. Go to an alpha class. Or maybe you're this judgmental religious person that has a blind spot. You say, I'm good. But no, you're not. You're just making yourself God. Admit it. You have to start by admitting that you're bad before Jesus can ever come for you. You need to recognize your own brokenness before you can help him bring healing to yourself. But this is the great part. Some of you are here today, and this is the cool thing. You're the person today that says, I'm like the tax man or the prostitute or the other sinners. I messed up. I'm bad. I know it. You're not alone. Would you just bow your heads? If you're really sincere today, I want you to picture Jesus walking to your chair. I want you to hear his voice. He says, come follow me. Come follow me. I can't manufacture that voice, but you know if you're hearing that voice. If you are, would you just simply say, man, that's me. I need, I need some changes in my life. I need to follow Jesus. I've made a mess. I am that person. That's who he came from. Would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Would you do that? There's people raising their hand. I'd love that. Way to go, you guys. Awesome. Just pray this prayer. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Show me my blind spots. And I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you everyone to look at me. I want you to see what might happen today. 
Pastor Nick's been talking about this for a while, and we've been talking about it, and I'm excited to see it. On Easter, we're going to baptize a whole bunch of people. But I think it's okay for you to just declare it ahead of time. If you know that through this process in the last year and all this, you're one of those kind of people that Jesus come to and said, hey, come follow me. And you know that this is the day that you're going to say, hey, I, I want to be baptized. I want to do this. And you've made a decision for Jesus Christ. They're actually a class that's going to happen in between services. So I want you to consider, I, I want you to see this. And we're going to cheer him when they do this. We're going to all clap if this happens, Okay. If it doesn't happen, you just laugh at me. Okay, it's okay. I want you to consider, if you raised your hand, you said, I'm that kind of person. I've not been baptized. I need to be baptized. I want to be baptized. Easter is my Sunday. I want you to stand up and make your way to the cross. Would you do that? We'll cheer you on. Is there anybody that's bold enough to do that right now? Let's just watch. Let's see if that happens. Anybody courageous enough to say, I'm doing that right now. I'm going to do that. Anybody? Okay, it's okay. Here's what I'm going to suggest. If at the end of the service, you, you weren't ready to be public today, but you're going to do it on Easter, there's a class right, next, right, right in this room on the side here. It's ready for you. But I have one more prayer. This morning when I was making this message, I, I, I really got inspired to think there's a new St. Patrick here. I was thinking about the city of Seattle and all the different cities that we look at and we, we see how they seem to lack God. They've created their own gods and they live by their own morals and it's just, it's, it's a dead end. I've been thinking today, who's the St. Patrick that's going to step up and go to that place? And bring the gospel there. Not not the religion that they want to hear. That tells them what they want to hear. But the really true religion of Jesus Christ. That changes hearts and lives. That has values that will change their life. That calls them out of their brokenness. Even if they get canceled. The message of Jesus Christ. Will not get canceled. I want to pray today because I believe maybe there's somebody in these two services, in this auditorium today, that there's a stirring in your soul, and you're the next St. Patrick. And I, want, I just want to pray today for you. Lord Jesus, you know this, you know this crowd, Lord. You know each person here. I got to believe, I have to believe today, Lord that you're talking to someone right here that's going to call, be called right into the communities that are so godless, that so desperately need to know. Not the, not the fake Jesus, not the, not the cultural Jesus, the real Jesus, the power that changes lives, that still draws people in. And I just invite you, Lord, to speak to them today. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know who you are, but if you're that person, I I want you to talk to Pastor Nick because I I want you to make sure you have that opportunity to know how do you take that next step toward ministry. May God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Dan. So good to have you back. Maybe that was you he was talking to. And while we didn't have a movement, people moving, I'll say we're gonna do this one last worship song as we close. Maybe it's baptism that you need to do. Maybe it's just to go to the crosses. Prayer team members are there during this song and after the service, there'll be a baptism class right over here. Will you stand with me as we do this one last song? Church, if you need to leave, you're dismissed if you need to go, but we're gonna do this last song that we can worship together.